Hey everyone, just wanted to introduce Andrew. Although, do you go by Pandy? I mean, Pandy Knight? It's a nickname, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, wanted to introduce Pandy Knight. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Automation Panda. Um, and I'm so excited to do our second, what, second playwright uh, training this year. And uh, yeah, Andrew, take, take it away. Sure. Thank you so much, Tracy. And hello, everybody. I'm thankful to be here. My name is Penny Knight. I'm the Automation Panda. I do a lot of automation, testing, development kind of stuff. Uh, historically, I've been a, uh, excuse me, been a software engineer in test, building solutions to testing problems. So this is very, very much in my wheelhouse. I've been playing with Playwright for almost two years now. I think it's a phenomenal test framework. I have years and years of uh, work with Selenium WebDriver and frameworks of that nature. And then when I found Playwright, I was like, whoa, this is really, really nice. So I'm excited to talk with you about this today. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce Playwright through uh, just talking about it with some slides. And then I'm going to jump into live coding and basically show you how to build a test project with Playwright from the ground up. Uh, there will be times throughout this where I'll stop and say, there are any questions? We can have a little discussion. I intend this to be rather informal, right? This isn't like a time conference talk or anything. So we ready to jump in? Yes, I see thumbs up in yeah. the smiling faces. That's good. <laughs> All right. So everything I show today is going to also be in GitHub. Uh, you can scan this QR code. I've got the link here. Basically, uh, github.com slash automation panda that's my handle slash awesome web testing playwrights so uh there's this repository is essentially set up to be like a self-guided tutorial all of the content i'm going to show today comes from here so if we don't get through everything you can take it all on your own as like a little independent assignment so let me ask a question of the group here who likes to find problems in their code? Raise your hand. Right? I mean, I personally, I take the stance of I don't like there being problems in my code, but I actually like to uncover the problems that happen to exist in my code. Right? That's right, Jamie. I want to find them if they exist precisely. Right? I, I basically want like the easy button. I want to say, okay, smash it. Tell me what the problems are. Right, because I'm so deep in my own code, I don't know what, what's going on anymore, <laughs> right? So if you, if you happen to answer no to that, would you rather ship those bugs to production? I don't think so. I think I would rather know sooner rather than later if there are problems in my code, uh, because having the, the end user or the customer find them is usually not a very good thing. Usually you want to catch them earlier. You want to identify them and resolve them uh, before they become detrimental. Now, we've said, yeah, we like to uncover the problems. We like to uncover them sooner rather than later. Um, but who actually wants to go creating tests to get that feedback? Who, who likes to develop tests? Deep down, I find that a lot of people actually don't like developing tests. So there's some weird people out there like me who do. But I think at least from, from people I've talked to um, and even some of my own frustrations, I think most people don't necessarily want to spend their time making tests or doing testing. They just want the easy button to tell them what's wrong, right? And so the exercise of testing is really more about mitigating enough risk to be satisfactory to move forward with deployment or shipping. <laughs> Am I right? We don't want to spend a whole ton of time doing testing. Why? Testing doesn't, doesn't bring us value. It just mitigates risk. Um, and, and so historically with a lot of more complicated test tools or um, clunkier kinds of things, we spend a lot of time just on the testing. 
right? Whether that's manual testing, grinding through it, or automation trying to develop it. And when those tests don't deliver appropriate value, when they don't deliver the feedback we're looking for, we feel like it's a waste of time. And arguably it is, <laughs> right? So we want to be able to, moreover, build the mechanisms of good feedback rather than just focusing on the testing. So what challenges have you all faced with testing? Like I said, I've been doing this for over a decade. <laughs> testing is hard. It is not easy. Um, feel free to pop some of the challenges that you faced in, in the chat. I'm gonna share some of the ones that, that I have personally experienced. Uh, I found that testing can be slow. Uh, especially if you are doing it manually, but also if you're automating like end-to-end -end web UI tests, right? They can be very slow to execute. Uh, tests are also tend to be brittle in the sense that if anything changes in the application, your test could break. Or, I mean, heck, the, there's lots of flaky issues with tests as well because of all the inherent race conditions around waiting and synchronization that you need to handle. Right, if you try to click a button before the page loads, kaboom, your test explodes. Um, and that becomes very frustrating for the execution of tests where you might say, oh, well, 90% um, completion rate of testing is a good day. Ooh, that's bad. Uh, other frustrations, if you ever take a step down into the test cases or the test code, lift up the hood and try to look inside, sometimes these tests don't make any sense. <laughs> they might be long, they might be complicated, they might be covering more than one behavior at a time. Um, people might have written things in a confusing way. Uh, and, and all that creates friction around trying to understand what exactly is being covered. Uh, also, the fact that, like I said before, you don't make money off of tests, right? You make money off of the features you ship and so there's this, this, this tension of, well, why am I spending so much time doing testing, right? We push new features now, right? Now that's a whole different conversation there, but nevertheless, there is this tension within development teams about how much effort they should put on testing. And finally, this one hits developers especially hard, I find, is that testing requires changing your mental context. Right, you develop new features. You're in the product code. You're making whatever in the React, new feed, new web page, new component, new library, whatever. You're like you're getting the coders high from doing that. Then when it comes time to do testing, you have to stop that, adopt a whole new mindset, pivot, and do something different. And that can be very disruptive in terms of our day to day workflow, right? Because it is it is frustrating and annoying to have to change your mental context and to do a different kind of activity when you're already kind of in the flow, so to speak. So these are all problems that I have personally experienced. Uh, let's see what, what y'all have said in the chat here. Uh, oh my goodness, we have hot takes. Spending more time writing tests than the code. Oh, wow, yes, yes. Uh, Setting up mocks in general can be quite a fun experience. Uh, fun, <laughs> fun importation mark, yes. Right, because that, that's, that's another thing that, that gets to what um, I think uh, Ignacio was saying, where you, spend, you end up spending more time doing the test than the regular code. Because it's like, okay, well you do a mock, what's a mock? It's a knockoff or a fake of a real service, right? So the dilemma is, do you just set up your real service in your test environment and try to push data through it? Or do you try to mock it to stub it out? Both require a lot of work. Um, and then the, the, the thing with a mock is if, if, the main, if the regular service changes, well, you have to change your mock too. Who's gonna do that, right? So hence it's fun, no, totally understand. Debugging brittle tests, oh yeah, right? Where's this thing failing? Oh, I can't even get to the point of failing because it's starting to fail here now. Hmm, definitely felt the brittle and flaky bits at times. At times, it's the story of my life. Uh, let's see, Jan, uh, testing environment. Having a separate DB for testing or mocks is, yep, <laughs> right? Trying to set up your test environments is no small feat. Uh, and they're never going to be perfectly mirrored your production environment, are they? Usually production is way too big by the time you started bothering to test it. Oh gosh, <gasps> yeah. And you might have to do like shared test environments or, or they're just 
I mean, in a perfect world, everything you just throw in a Docker container and spin it up, right? How many of us live in the perfect world? I don't live in the perfect world. I want to live in the perfect world. I don't live in the perfect world. So yes, we all feel pain. Just from reading these comments, I feel like we are commiserating on the pain of testing challenges. Um, and it sucks. Um, but I think there are uh, solutions to this. Um, there have been okay solutions in the past. I think there's better solutions now. Historically, one way that, that um, teams have tried to mitigate these pains is to follow uh, what's called a testing pyramid. Has anybody heard of this or seen this before? Yes, no, yeah, yeah, no, okay. So the idea behind the testing pyramid is it was a, it, blah, 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 blah. it was a way to frame your testing strategy to, to help you focus on um, getting the most value out of your tests. And the way the pyramid works is like this. Uh, you would stack your layers of tests from bottom to top, uh, unit testing at the bottom, uh, component testing next layer up, followed by API testing, and then UI testing would be at the top. The, the idea behind the structuring is that the lower in the pyramid you are, the closer you are to the code, and the smaller and more bite-sized your tests are. Higher in the pyramid, the larger your tests are, the more complicated they are, and therefore the more risky they are to own and operate. So the theory was that we would want to have a, we would want to push tests down the pyramid as much as possible, right? We want to have a very large, strong base of unit tests. Why? Because they are directly touching the code. They reveal problems very quickly. Um, these tests are very, very small. They have no external dependencies and they can run very fast. Right, order of magnitude execution time for a unit test is like a millisecond. Right, boom. You can you can run a suite of like a thousand milliseconds in like a minute, or sorry, a thousand unit tests in like a minute. Right, it's it's meant to be super fast, super quick. Anytime you would build your application, pretty much you run the unit test right after that, and it should take no more than a few minutes total. Um, and and the idea of unit testing is that it's meant to be very stable because it doesn't have these external dependencies. Um, oh, Jan's being a troublemaker. I've seen suites that run for 20 minutes. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm speaking to the ideal world. Some people do bad things in unit tests, but in a good case, they should be short, sweet, to the point. Um, and, and really, the, the main thing of unit testing was that it was meant to be stable, right? You're, you shouldn't be making API calls or database calls or file system calls, right? And, and it's removing those dependencies that makes them very reliable. And so the idea was reliable is good, short and sweet is good, fast is good, let's put most of our testing there that we can. Then as we move up the pyramid, we, we increase complexity. So, um, you know, component testing is kind of a newer thing. So in the historic pyramid, you may have not seen component testing, but component testing is kind of like testing UI units right? It's like we took pieces of UI and turned them into unit tests. So they, they again, have the benefits of being short and sweet and reliable and all those kinds of things. And that's why component testing is having a moment, <laughs> right? You know, you have frameworks like Storybook that are all about building and testing component libraries. You have Cypress has officially added component testing. Playwright has added component testing. Um, but if we keep moving up the pyramid, I would say the next real layer of complexity is when you get to the API level. Right, because you're introducing external dependencies with your API testing. Right, in traditional API testing, you formulate your HTTP request, you send it over, you get a response, you parse it, and you look to see what's going on. Request, receive, ratify. That's the pattern for an API test. Um, these were still, you know, reasonably fast. They're not as fast as unit tests because you have the network hopping back. They're, a, they're. They do have, what am I trying to say here? They are fairly reliable, right? As long as your network connections are good and the services you're testing are available in your test environment, you know, it, it should be okay, right? Um, there's, there may be a little bit of synchronization you have to do, but usually the, the request clients that you're using are going to have that built in anyway. So th you, you have a fairly reliable way to do testing. Um, in cases where it it was either unreliable or if you just had so many different services you had to test, you might want to do something like contract testing. Another topic, 
you can look that up if you're interested in it. But it was still like, okay, it takes a bit more time, but we can still get away with this. Very top of the pyramid, the UI level, that's where you had issues because it was the most complicated test that had the heaviest kind of tooling. And these were historically the most flaky and the most brittle. Why? Because you're not just testing code and you're not just testing protocol. You're testing, oh, I log into the app and I click this button and I wait. And I go to this page and I wait. <laughs> And I fill in this text and hit submit and I wait, <laughs> right? So these tests, it's not so much the automation tool that's causing it to be slow. It's, it's the application itself, right? Because there's things going on in that application, right? Um, and so the thought is, well, these tests are big, slow, heavy. They're more, more effort to maintain. We should have fewer of them. We still need some of them, but we should have fewer of them. Hence the pyramidal shape i see simone is in the chat saying wait five thousand. Oh oh my gosh the pain the pain of waiting hard sleeps are an anti-pattern don't do that <laughs> but nevertheless they are pervasive so when i say pyramid strategy that's what i mean is this kind of framing historically and the reason why is because we didn't have better tools or better practices to be able to make those upper levels of testing um, easier or more stable, right? They were seen as the, the heavyweights. They're, they deliver value, but we need, to, we need to do less of that because as much value as they provide, they're detracting from value and how heavy they were. Mm. The, the overall issue here is that honestly, the end-to-end -end kind of testing that we would put at the top of the pyramid is very valuable in the feedback it gives, right? There's a big difference between saying, oh, you couldn't parse a string date properly and, oh, your login's broken, right? When we look at the behaviors and features we're trying to develop, they're ultimately meant for humans, right? It's, it's humans who are using your web apps and your mobile apps, right? And so the end-to-end -end tests are very, very valuable in validating the value that these behaviors you're building provide. And so trying to label end-to-end -end testing or UI testing is bad just because it's a little bit harder to do really opens up a different vector of risk, right? Because now you're saying, well, I we're not going to worry so much about that, uh, but that's ultimately the, the place where your humans interact with. They're not calling APIs directly. They're not looking at your code. They're using the application itself. And so you we really need a way to, to handle that kind of testing well. So with that in mind, um, I want us to adopt three modern testing goals um, to kind of reshape how we think about testing and how we approach these different kinds of tests. Uh, first of all, uh, we should focus on building fast feedback loops rather than building certain types of tests. Ultimately, the value is not the test itself, it's in the kind of feedback it gives. And each of those layers, UI, API, and unit, offer valuable kinds of feedback, and we shouldn't be shortchanging any of those layers. And so rather than trying to shape our strategy by certain proportions or numbers of tests, we should be looking at building these feedback loops to give us the feedback we need for the types of applications we're developing. Um, second, we need to make test development as fast and painless as possible, right? Our main interest is not in building the best test project you've ever seen. It's in building the best applications you've ever seen. And testing is just a part of the development process. So the, the faster we can do that and the, the less painful we can do that, the better it's going to be for development. And then with that in mind, we should be choosing test tools that naturally complement our development workflows. Right. Uh, historically, there there has been this big separation between the developer and the tester. Right. And there's there's a whole bunch of problems with that setup. Right. Developers would abdicate any sense of quality or testing work. Testers would be a little bit clueless about exactly how apps are supposed to work and all that. And there would be this us versus them mentality. The way I see it, development and testing are two sides of the same coin. <laughs> we're, we're just trying to make quality apps here. And so if I can bring in tooling that helps me 
perform that co that workflow cohesively without the mental context shift, without the 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 painfulness of flakiness and brittleness and fighting the tools. If I can have tools work with me rather than against me, that's just going to make app development so much better. And this is where I feel like Playwright as a modern test framework can really help us. Let's learn how. How many people have heard of Playwright? I'm guessing by now, most of y'all are probably, yeah, like I've heard of it, maybe I've even used it. Um, it, it two years ago, if I had asked that question, it'd be crickets, right? <laughs> Playwright's fairly new. So let's all get on the same page. Let me share what Playwright is. Playwright is a modern open source web test framework from Microsoft. It comes from the same division of Microsoft that brought you Visual Studio Code, that brought you TypeScript, all those cool developer projects. That's where Playwright comes from. The way Playwright works is that it manipulates the browser through debug protocols. This is different from some of the other browser automation tools you may have seen like Selenium or Cypress. Uh, basically, Playwright goes in the back door and twiddles with things. Uh, and because it's using debug protocols, it is super fast, uh, magnitudes faster than the other test frameworks. Playwright works with um, many of the browsers you would know, but with a caveat. Uh, Playwright takes a unique approach in that it primarily tests browser projects. So rather than testing Google Chrome, it tests Chromium. Instead of testing Apple Safari, it tests WebKit. Uh, the three major browser projects these days are Chromium, Firefox, WebKit. Playwright has built-in support for all of these. Uh, you can test full-blown Google Chrome and full-blown Microsoft Edge uh, if you want to through browser channels. The reason for doing browser projects is for efficiency, for simplicity, for optimization. Uh, when you install Playwright, you will install the browser's projects together with it, and it's all version controlled together. So you don't have to worry about extra setup. You don't have to worry about putting some Selenium WebDriver executable in there. Um, everything is tightly controlled for you, which is very nice. Um, also, the browser projects are leaner than the full browsers, right? We've probably all dealt with the, the fact that Chrome eats like a gig of RAM, right? <laughs> Every time we run it, maybe not that much, maybe it's half a gig, but still that's ridiculous, right? The browser projects are much leaner than that. So you can start them up, close them down much faster. They don't, they don't gobble up as much resources. Um, and most of the functionality that you're testing in a web app are going to be in the browser project. Versus, so you don't necessarily need the full browser application. Uh, there, there, there are some very fringe cases where, yes, there are certain things you might want the full browser for, but it, for most people, in, in most cases, it's, it's just fine to use browser projects. Um, also, some of the nice things that Playwright offers are advanced features like automatic weighting, test generation, UI mode, all these things. And I'm gonna be demoing them in, in just a few moments here. Uh, Playwright can also test UIs and APIs together, which is really cool. So, I mean, um, when, when we would think of Playwright, we would think about like testing an application out of web browser, but you can also call APIs as well, right? Usually like you would want to call some APIs to maybe add some data to the system, then refresh your page, because it's a lot easier to add data via API than try to navigate around and click buttons to do all that. Um, you could even do API testing purely by itself with Playwright if you want it. You don't necessarily need to open a browser for a Playwright test. I know some folks have been using Playwright purely for their API testing. Um, to me, that, that seems a little strange, but it's like, you know what? If it works, don't mess with success. And finally, one of my favorite parts about Playwright is that it has bindings for multiple programming languages. Uh, you can use Playwright in JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, Java, and C Sharp. Uh, this is really nice because, you know, even though we might on this call all be within the front end Node.js JavaScript world, uh, the entire world isn't like that. <laughs> in fact, me personally, I'm very much a Python person. Uh, I don't know if you knew that or not. It's not a secret or anything. It's really cool that I get to walk, be welcomed into web spaces. But um, you know, for somebody like me, who, who does a lot in the Python ecosystem, it's really nice that I can use Playwright in Python if I want to. 
right? I know there are teams who historically have done all their test automation in Java, right? And so they, they have deep Java skills and um, they, their teams aren't just going to change on a dime to learn a new language just because. And so for them to be able to use, you know, maybe move over from Selenium to Playwright, but still stay in the Java stack can be very helpful for them. So underneath the hood, um, it's Playwright does run on Node.js. The language bindings are just kind of like these things on top of it that feed down, but it's still nice to have that option. Uh, the way Playwright handles browsers, like I said, is a bit unique. And it's not just in the fact of that they're using browser projects, but also it's unique in how they set up and tear down browser instances for testing. Um, <clears throat> has anyone on the call done, um, has anyone on the call done like Selenium WebDriver stuff? No, okay, maybe Cypress. Okay, so a little bit of Cypress. So, <clears throat> cool, cool. Um, the way that browsers work with, with Playwright is that rather than creating a new browser instance for every single test as is done with other frameworks, there's usually one browser instance that is um, a run for the duration of all tests. And I might think that's a little bit dangerous, right? Sharing resources between tests doesn't that break test case independence. Independence is preserved through what are called browser contexts. So every test will pull out a new browser context from the browser instance. That keeps everything safe, secure, and non-shared. Contexts are very, very quick and easy to spin up. They take a fraction of a second and they're very easy to tear down versus browser instances, which might take you know, a few seconds to fully come up to speed. Um, so the fact that with Playwright, you can peel browser context from a single browser instance makes your full start to end test execution time a lot faster. Then within each context, you can have pages. Pages are the things within the, the um, browser that you're actually interacting with, right? Most tests only ever need one page, but you can have multiple pages within a context if you like. Um, versus Cypress, you can only ever have one page at a time. So cool stuff that Playwright enables. If we wanna compare Playwright to other uh, frameworks like Selenium and Cypress, I think all of these are good tools. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, the, the main differences are Selenium is more of your, your classic old school browser automation engine. It's not a full framework. Uh, it, it's just purely for low level commands to interact with the browser. Um, it uses WebDriver protocol, which is a standard. Um, the project runs on open source standards and governance, which is community driven, which is really cool. But a lot of people have had issues with Selenium in the past because of uh, issues around like slowness and flakiness, because you kind of have to do everything yourself. And so if you don't put the protections in place, you, you get bad consequences. Uh, Cypress uh, has been very popular the past several years has great developer experience, right? You pop up the Cypress window, it's all good. It is a full modern framework and much in the sense of Playwright and that it, it does a lot of things for you. Um, the challenges with Cypress is that uh, it is rather limited in, in some of the things it can do, right? It, it manipulates web apps through direct JavaScript. It's stuck in the browser. Um, you can only have like one page at a time. Execution has historically been slow as well. Playwright, Debug protocol is therefore very fast. It, it kind of provides the best of the both worlds um, between Selenium and Cypress, right? You, you, in Selenium, you have or the things that is similar to Selenium is that you have multiple language bindings. The thing similar to Cypress is that you have the modern features in a full framework. Um, so I personally like Playwright. That's why I'm talking about it today. I've got the shirt on. I think it's great. So uh, before I dive into code, I'm going to stop here. Does anybody have any questions? Nope. Everybody's feeling good. Cool. All right. So I'm going to flip out of here. Oopsie. Wrong. There we go. And I am going to, oh my gosh, where's my thing? There we go. 
let's create a playwright project from scratch and see some of these advanced features I've been talking about. Does anybody so, have any ideas about like specific examples that you want to see or anything like that too? No, because <laughs> I know we went, I went, I knew we went through like basics with Debbie previously. So maybe getting into like more of the advanced stuff would be amazing. Okay, sure, sure. So uh, when, when y'all met with Debbie, did she walk through like the, um, like the UI mode and the tracing and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. The reg the one where she recorded it man um, automatically, right? Is that the trace? Okay, okay. So y'all have already yeah, seen yeah, yeah. this before. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Well, if that's the case, then um, you know what? Let me let me do this. I'm going to pop the link into the repo into the chat. So typically, what I would do is I would kind of walk through all that. I'd be like, look at this world tour of all the cool stuff in Playwright. But if you want, if y'all want to get some more advanced stuff, I can just open up the project rather than build it from scratch, and we can just kind of dig into the code from there. If that sounds good. Yeah, that would be great because as as we see the code, we'll probably have some questions for sure. Okie dokie. So let's do that. Give me just a moment here. Oh, sweet! I already had the project open. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, uh, let me increase the text size a little bit. Is the text size good? Okay, branch, what branch am I in? Okay, okay, I'm going to switch branch real quick. I have the repository broken on a branch by chapter that I usually walk through. Uh, get, check out, boom. This test. Okay. Mark had so, a He said, can we test a single component with Playwright? Yes. So Playwright does have um, experimental support for component testing. Let me pull that up real quick. Playwright.dev. Uh, where's the component testing thing? I don't have examples of that ready. Hold on a second. Play right. Oh, Here we go. Pull this up on the screen. And I'll put this in the chat here. So this is what it would look like to do example or to do component testing with Playwright. You would mount your component, you would um, make assertions on it, and it would just be like any other kind of test. Uh, the Playwright team actually did a video showing a preview of, of this working. So if you want to dig into component testing, definitely check out these resources here. Oh, we got another question. You mentioned using Playwright for just API testing. I'd be curious about an example of that. So I don't have an example of doing pure API testing. Um, it's more of just I've heard people talking about it and, and them telling me they've done it. If you want to learn more specifically about the API testing capabilities of Playwrights, oh gosh, where is it? Here we go, API testing. Now, anytime there's a topic of player, I just go to the docs <laughs> and I look at it. Uh, the way the API testing works in Playwright is you have this um, request object, much in the same sense that you would have a page object that's a fixture that you inject, there is also a, a request. And so the request, you can make any sort of HTTP request off of it. So here in this example, you know they're showing re they're showing request dot post, you know an HTTP post request. They're putting in that uh, the resource path to do it, and here they're using a little bit of substitution for it. They're passing along data that would probably get passed as like a JSON body or XML. I think that's configurable. Um, and then you get the response back, and then you can make assertions on the response. So for example, here, uh, expect this new issue response okay. This is, this is like, did it have a 200 response code? Make sure that's true, okay. Um, here's another example of like a request get. Okay, expect that to be truthy. Um, then you can take the response JSON body of it and you can perform assertions on that too, which is really nice. 
So you can do any kind of HTTP, get, post, patch, put, delete, any request you've got. Um, control space in Visual Studio Code gives you all the different kinds of things you can get off of a request. If you've done API stuff before, it's fairly boilerplate. Um, uh, I'm showing the, the code here for TypeScript. Uh, I know that there's API support as well. That's good for the um, Python binding. I think in Python underneath the hood, it uses a request or something, but the patterns are, are fairly simple. Um, what, what I like to do with, with the API support in Playbright, like I said, it's not necessarily do primary, do direct API testing with it. You know, um, I like to use the APIs to assist with my end-to-end -end tests. So what I might do is, okay, let's say I have, I don't know, I'm, I have a, a, a commercial loan banking application that I'm testing and I need to add customer data into the back end of the system before I can load up the next, the next loan opportunity for them. So rather than, like I said, go through and navigate through the system using clicks and scrapes and input fields for creating however much data I need. Let me just hit the API real quick and set up. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, now when I go there, oh, this, this particular customer already has like three loans there for them that I can work with, right? That's how I prefer to use APIs. Um, and so it's really a hybrid kind of approach where it's APIs plus UIs together, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds more like a testing framework than an end-to-end -end testing tool. Ta-da! True story. That's great. I feel like Playwright isn't only an end. Yep. Okay. Boom. Good. Yes. Yes. Right. The framework is there to empower us. It's there to help us. Right. So <clears throat> great, great questions, y'all. So, um, so the, 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 oh, hold on a second. the tests that I was going to show you were for a basic Trello web app. Uh, I'm sure most people use Trello or some sort of board. Um, <clears throat> shoot, I have to pull that open to part of me just another moment here. New window, uh, open recent Trello. Okie dokie. So uh, my good friend, Philip Pritz is a Cypress ambassador. He developed this, this local version of a basic Trello app. This is what he has used when he does his workshops. He's allowed me to use it. I'm very grateful. And so what I like to do is I will run this app and then I'll do tests against it. So let me, let me pull this app up. I believe all I need is uh, NPM start. Give this a moment. So now it's running on my localhost machine. And if I bring it up. So here's the application. I can create a board. Then I can create some columns. And I can create cards on it, right? Like, uh, walk the dog buy groceries, All right? And then I can edit these more directly. I can change stuff. I can move them between columns, basic Trello functionality. <clears throat> what I've done in Playwright is I have automated a test, and this is in the example code in the third branch, that would create a new board with a list and cards on it, very much like I just showed manually. So let's, what I would like to do is I'd like to walk through this example, and then I'd like to walk through how to refactor this to go from a good test to a great test. Uh, this is, I don't have any, I don't have many API calls. I have a couple I could show you, but mostly this is gonna focus on like the web UI kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in showing you technique than syntax, if that makes sense. So here's my test. It's in a basic project. What I want to do before I run these tests, well, before I run this test, this is singular here. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to clear the database, right? I need to have a, a clean starting point. 
Now, depending on what application and products you're testing, you're going to have to decide what your starting point is. It might be that you just want to wipe out a database and, and start fresh because your app is small and it's okay to do that. Other times you might have to kind of establish like a golden state of your database to say, I need to have these things in it and that's the starting point. Or it might be that you can just have what anything goes. And in that case, whatever's in the database is in the database and you either have to discover things in the database and pull them out, or you just keep adding new things on top and only using the new things. Uh, there's a whole talk I could give on test data management because this is a very simple example, I'm just going to nuke the database before every single test. <laughs> um, so that's with, within the scope of this, that will be acceptable. It may not be acceptable in all cases. So in order to do that, uh, the, the application actually has an endpoint that will let me reset it. Why? Because this is meant for like demo purposes, right? So here I'm showing a playwright um, API call. It's in my before all, so before all the tests are going to run, request, post, reset, boom. So that sets the, the initial point. So next, here's the test to create a new board with a list of cards. Very, very boilerplate kind of setup here. Test function, descriptive name, uh, defining the async part, using the pages, injecting the page fixture, meaning I can interact with the page. Behind the scenes, we have the browser and we have the, the, um, the, the page context and everything. So here, we're gonna go step by step, right? What I like to do is I like to separate my, my code in paragraphs, whether this is product code or test code. So like, oops, I've got, okay, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna load the application. Await page.go to with my homepage. Cool. Um, for better testing practice, you might want to um, pass this in as like an environment variable, or um, I know within the playwright configuration, you can actually set a base URL. So that way, instead of having to do this, you could just say something like that. Um, the reason why you don't necessarily want to hard code these, these base URLs is because what if you're targeting different environments, right? Like you might have a, like a, an alpha, a beta, a staging, a test, I don't know. And so you wanna treat that more as configuration rather than code. Um, I've just hard coded it here because again, simple example, but be mindful of the environment challenges. So what do we do once we load the app? We need to create a new board. So just like we saw uh, that, that initial page come up with a nice little picture saying, hey, make your first board. What we're gonna do is we are going to, uh, we need to now interact with the page. So we have to use selectors and locators to find elements and then send interactions to those elements. So here we go, await page dot get by placeholder, name of your first board dot fill chores. What's going on here? First of all, oh wait, everything is async. Why? Because, great, awesome. Page dot get by placeholder. This is a method that constructs a locator object. Uh, Playwright also has just the plain old page dot locator, which we can see elsewhere in our code. But Playwright offers these, these niftier kinds of locator builders that help us build better locators. So what we're saying here is I want a locator that's going to look for elements based on placeholder text in an input field, right? Because when we, when we loaded up that Trello app and there was that input field that had that placeholder text of name your first board. So I want to select based on that. This kind of selector is a bit more resistant to, page, to, to changes you might make in the DOM. So it, trying to, to hinge on the text that's displayed is a way to be like, okay, well, it's more user focused. Um, is it perfect? No, why? Because anybody could change the text at any time, just like anybody can change the DOM at any time. But at least this way, it makes your test a little more readable and understandable because people are more intuitively going to recognize what that element is based on a placeholder text versus some obscure ID or some obscure XPath. So what we do is we construct the locator object. Now, this is not an element object. This is a locator object. A locator is a pointer to an element. We use the locator to fetch the element, right? But the locator object itself is just the reference. So we construct that locator object. And the getting of the element happens when we interact with, with that locator. So 
it's fairly common to see this chained in playwright like this. We'll make the locator object, and then we'll say, uh, what's the interaction? Fill. Fill means I want to type text into an input field. So what input field? The one given by this locator. I'm going to fill with the text chores. That means I'm going to create a board named chores. Um, what's really nice about this is that waiting is implicit. It's, it's baked in. So if this particular element doesn't yet appear on the page, Playwright will wait for it to appear and become interactable. I think default is about five seconds. You can customize it. Uh, but nice. that way you don't you don't have this misfire, right? You don't and you don't have to put a bunch of explicit waiting code in here. Like um, if you were doing Selenium WebDriver to do it right, you'd have to say something like driver dot no not driver wait dot until driver arrow um, driver find elements plural with the locator greater than zero, meaning it actually exists on the page. And then you make your call driver dot find element with the same locator dot send keys blah. Right. Waiting should be implicit, <laughs> right? It should just be there. It should be automatic for you, right? Because we as humans, when we think of a click, we think go boop. When we think of fill, we think chuk, 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 right. So we should make our framework do all the lower level things that we don't necessarily have to do ourselves. Um, so, uh, Linda, I do like that it integrates a lot of the test library syntax. Yep, thumbs up. Um, Ignacio, does the selector need to be called each time like this? Uh, hold on to that question, Ignacio. I'll show you the trick in a moment. Uh, what happens after five seconds if the element is not visible? Timeout happens. That's when it would be, oh, Playwright would escape with some sort of exception saying, hey, I, I tried to find it. I waited for it. It wasn't there. I can't move on. So it's better to, to have the built-in waiting versus not have it, try it right away. And if it's not there, kaboom, right? Because why? Web pages are a bit slow to take a moment. Mm. So uh, I like how Playwright separates locator from interaction. I think that's very nice. And to get to Ignacio's question, I'll show you how we can refactor that even better in a moment. But a lot of times your, your rote basic kind of Playwright code is gonna look like this. It's gonna follow this pattern. And you can see the rest of the lines of this paragraph are very similar. Right, page, get by placeholder, press enter. Um, and then we have some assertions here. So with Playwright, we're using the expect function. Um, I'm pretty sure most people in a JavaScript front end world are familiar with expect. Um, this might be newer for people, let's say in Java or C Sharp or Python, but JavaScript is pretty, pretty standard. So here we're saying expect the page locator, meaning some elements to have a particular value. So when I create the new chores board and I hit enter, that takes me to what the board is and that new page with the board should have the board title text being chores. That's what I'm saying here. The way the expect works is actually pretty cool. Notice how the parentheses here are put around the locator objects, right? That means the expect is targeting the locator. This enables Playwright to have web first assertions. So not only is waiting done when you interact, waiting is done when you perform verifications as well. And so for example here, even like this, this assertion will not only wait for the element given by this locator to appear on the page, but it will also wait for it to have this particular value. So if, if maybe something happened where it takes a second or two for an edit to reflect, you're still safe because it's still checking, right? That's really, really, really cool. Because as we know, synchronization is the biggest challenge with these end-to-end -end tests. Uh, other assertions like this, very similar. So uh, expect the placeholder text, enter list text to be visible. Sometimes we just wanna make sure something appears on the page and we wanna make sure that extra lists are not visible. Why? Because we haven't created them yet, right? So there's all these kinds of checks we can make. Most of the assertions you're going to be making in Playwright are probably going to be on elements, meaning using locators like this. But you can also perform assertions on other things like the page itself. Like if you want the page to have a title, you can say expect parenthesis page parenthesis dot to have title, things like that. Um, it, it all flows in very nicely with the expect syntax. 
So um, the other parts of this test are gonna be very similar. Um, creating a new list now that we've got a board. Enter the list title, the thing that we verified was appearing there before. You're gonna fill it with some, some, some column name to do. Uh, press enter, commits it. Then you're going to expect that it actually was created. Uh, you can add cards to the list. Again, this is all very similar kinds of stuff. It becomes very repetitive, right? Um, here's a, a bit more of an advanced kind of uh, assertion where here, instead of checking that this element here has one particular text value, we're passing in a list, meaning this locator is not just pinpointing one element, it's getting a list of elements. And we're expecting that that list of elements has text one, two, three. So we don't need to piecemeal that out and try to do like indexing and crap. We can just say, hey, you know, a locator can pinpoint one element or it can pinpoint multiple. If I want to get a list and I want to just make sure that the list has these particular string values, boom, boom. Very concise, very easy. I love this because if you want to do this in Selenium or Cypress, it's a pain in the you know what. <laughs> um, so assertions can be pretty advanced. I don't even know all the assertions. You know what I do? I, I will say something like dot control space and here we go. Like, oh, look at all these. To be enabled, to be falsy, to be focused, to be hidden, to be equal, to have text, to have screenshot, properties, it, it just goes on and on. And so if I pick on one, like where was the to have text? To have text. Parenthesis, I get the full spill out of it here, right? If I need more and more detail, I go to the Playwright docs. I, I'm not the best Playwright developer in the world. I'm not. I just, I'm really good at control space and docs and I can figure it out. Why? Because I have testing sensibilities from years of the past that I now bring to this tool and this tool helps me in all the ways, <laughs> right? I feel like it's a very natural extension of my way of approaching testing. That's why I like it so much. Um, and so, yeah, you can see in here, like uh, here, here's that example of the the list of it where you boom, boom. And that's that's how I learned about it because I wanted to do this trick. And I was like, can I do this? Oh, I can do this. Bam, awesome. So the, that's, that's how I go about bumbling around. So you don't need to be an expert in testing or be an expert in playwright to be effective. You just need the VS Code extension, control space, go. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So let's let's see what happens when we run this test. Um, let me undo. So I do have the um, the app running. So I should be able to just say mpx playwright test, and then I want to give the path tests Trello spec. And let's see what happens. I hope this works. Oh, it might screw up because I'm doing more than one browser. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, let, let me, let me, let me, yeah, let me kill that for a moment. Let me do this um, uh, project. I only want to run against one browser, and I'll explain why in a moment. Dash dash projects. There we go. Boom. So this test is passing. Yay. Uh, if, if I wanted to um, show it, running, I could do dash dash headed and it'll pop up real quick and boom. I, was, I don't know if the, the Zoom captured that, but it was like super, super fast. Uh, you can configure to slow it down. There's a slow-mo setting you can do in the um, Playwright config file. I don't remember where it's supposed to go. Let me see. I will say this. One thing I like about the Python binding, it's on the command line versus JavaScript you have to do in the config. Um, uh, I won't worry about that right now, but you, you can see that it's passing. Now, um, the, when I first run it, I actually tried to run against all three of the browsers at the same time in parallel. That's cool, that's awesome. Um, a lot of times you may wanna do that. Sometimes you just wanna run one browser. For example, if you're trying to get through a CI process very quickly, you may only wanna run it on Chromium versus the other two. Um, that's more of testing strategy, your decisions. Um, the reason why I didn't want to run it on one browser specifically is because uh, I set this up in such a bad way that it could not run in parallel. You might be like, what? Well, what did I do to set up my test? 
I nuke the entire database, right? And so if I nuke the entire database and I run all the tests, then um, they're going to undo each other on the different workers, which is which is not good. So um, there are strategies we can we can do for that. Um, <clears throat> But before I go and start improving and refactoring, does anybody else have any other questions at this time? All the questions I probably have are part of your refactoring, so I'm going to keep them for later. Okay, sure. So Jan has a question. Since you need the app to be running to test against it, I wonder what a typical CI setup for running Playwright tests looks like. I suspect Docker is usually involved. Great questions. So um, perhaps, yes, Docker might be involved. Uh, if I can switch to, uh, yep, yeah. oopsie, uh, get checked out. I'm going to switch to the main branch, which has like the full, full code, which, um, but up under here, I have a GitHub action called run examples. And in here, this is like a very, very basic um, GitHub Actions workflow to show how you can run um, playwright tests from within whatever CI system you're doing. This will be using GitHub Actions, of course, but any sort of other CI system will be fa fairly similar. So what you would need to do um, in most cases is you will need to do your NPM install. You'll need to install Playwright, which is installing the browsers, like the browser projects. Uh, you might, only, like I said, to save time, you might only want to do Chromium or WebKit rather than all three significant time savings because that's like hundreds of megabytes you're downloading. And then you would execute your, your tests. If you have a, a specific app that you've got to, to run like this Trello app, most likely what you would do is between, you know, your setup step and your run step, like in here, you would have a step where you would launch the app right uh the bare bones basic simple case if it's if it's a small you know no js project you could just npm start it <laughs> ampersand so it doesn't hold the terminal and then uh, you might have to add an extra step to wait for it to come online and then you would just run your tests like that um, if it's a bit more complicated then yes what you might want to do is in terms of your your um your tests, you might want to pre-build a Docker container, right? Or maybe maybe there's a, a build step ahead that builds the Docker container. And then you want to run the Docker container and then run your tests against the things that are inside that Docker container. Um, or if you really, if you want to Dockerize the whole dang thing, you know, you could have the container that has your application, then you have a container that has your playwright test because it already has the, um, the, the browser's installed on it, right? So you don't have to wait two or three minutes for that to install. And then the you just pass in the parameters for all the different like web addresses. And so when you run the test container, it just launches straight into the playwright tests that hit the, 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 the apps container, boom, and then you're good to go. So that could be a way that you might wanna set that up. I think with, with play, like in, in other test frameworks, like trying to containerize the test, portion of it might not make as much sense, but I think in Playwright, there is a there is a case for it because you have those browsers set up. This, does that answer the question? Cool, great, great question. Awesome, awesome. Alrighty, so let's jump into the refactoring of it. Uh, so as we saw the code initially, it was basically just like a wall of, code, wall of commands, right? Just click this, do that, fill this, expect this, expect that. Um, and I think somebody pointed out, man, those locators are being reused all over the, or being copied and pasted all over the place, right? Um, and you know, I don't want to get into the whole DRY versus WET debate right now because it seems like Twitter's blown up about this. I don't care, right? <laughs> but when I see lots of locators being reused over and over again like that, what that shows to me is there's a lot of duplication of plain text stuff that could be, become very hard to refactor in the future. So. Check out a very common way to improve that is to use what are called page objects. Has anybody used page objects before? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So page objects are meant to be incredibly low tech. The idea is rather than spitting out all of your, your, your interaction code, just straight in a, in a test function, 
what if we created some sort of objects or class that models interactions with specific pages of your application? So the fact you might have like a login page or you might have a, a board page or you might have a getting started page, right? And there are certain elements on that page that are important for testing. And then there are certain interactions with those elements that are important for testing. So we can model the page structure and the interactions in that object. And so instead of saying something like await page dot get by placeholder da 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 dot fill, we could say something like, you know, await login page dot login, which is much more readable and reusable. We don't have the, the, the proliferation of selector text copied and pasted everywhere. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, I'd like to do this as kind of like a top-down view where I look at the tests and the pages, page objects that you're, they're using, and then to step deeper into what that page object code is doing. So same test, create a new board with the list and cards. In this, uh, we still have the same setup we had before, wipe out the database. We're still not gonna be able to run a parallel. We'll get to that in a moment. But in terms of the, the text of the test, it's a lot more concise and a lot more readable. Let's just, let's just read through what this looks like now. Await get started page dot load. Await get started page dot create first board named chores. Await board page, expect board new board loaded chores. Oh, so me coming into this the first time, I think this is a lot more readable than all that other stuff. It's much more concise, it's much more direct, and it, it, it denotes the intention which is something very important for test cases, right? A lot of people think that testing is just, let me just write a bunch of scripts that kind of bash through whatever I need to do on this web page or this API. But really there's a difference between a test case and, a, and test code, right? A test case is some sort of exercise of behavior and there is intention behind it. And we describe our test cases oftentimes in plain language. The test code, yes, when it comes to the automation, it's got all the low level mucking that happens. But it's very important that we don't lose that intention because we need to know what and why we are testing. And so the more we can write our test code with intention denoted in it, the better and more maintainable our tests will be in the long term, especially as you're higher up in the levels of the pyramid. So for me, when I read code like we saw before, it can be very hard to understand what is the what is the purpose, what is the intention. But when I see page object code like this, it's like, oh, I know exactly what what is being intended. Whether or not the test is doing that's another story. But at least I know the intention behind it. I know the why. So let's take a look at this getting started page. Uh, I have in my test directory a folder called pages, and I have a separate TypeScript module for each of these page objects. So the get started page is here. Uh, it's basically just a, a TypeScript class. Wow, fun, right? And it's it all fits in one view. It's only 20 lines. It's very bite-sized. I like this. I like small bite-sized pieces. And so what do I have? I, it, the getting started page will need a reference to the playwright page. That's how it makes interactions. And then it also needs a reference to each locator that it's going to be using. Uh, and so here I've got uh, my first board input. That was that, that placeholder text, right? And so in my constructor, I need to inject the playwright page by dependency injection. That's how it works. Otherwise I can't interact. So I store the reference to that page and then I construct all my locators. So if you remember, we saw this locator before, right? Page, get by placeholder name of your first board. In fact, we saw it copied and pasted a bunch of places before. Here I have the single place where it will be defined. So anytime I need to use this locator, I can just reference it from this getting started page. My get started page also has two methods. Each of these methods are an interaction. So I have a load method that's going to load the page, right? It's just page.goto. Uh, again, we've talked about the whole URL thing. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, but then we have the interaction of creating the first board. This is a bit more interesting. It can pass in the name of the board you want, and it has two commands. Uh, this dot pay my locator first board input fill and then press enter right so now i have a much more reusable way of creating boards and so when it came to my trello test 
here, I called my load and then I called my create first board. That's in a sense how page objects work, right? Uh, it's very, very low tech. Uh, the page objects are not a new concept. This goes back to the dark old days of early Selenium. <laughs> um, I think they work nicely in Playwright. I think they work more nicely in Playwright than with Selenium, but I'm not gonna go down that whole opinionated take. Um, but you can see the rest of my test is just using these page objects, right? Um, I'm, and I'm using some of them. I actually embed some assertions inside of some of them. Questionable whether or not that's good. I think it's Chabadol, it's okay. Um, there's others where I'm using a locator from a page object to specify a, an assertion here in the test. Why more reusable, more flexible. Um, but ultimately we see that this, this test now makes a, a bit more sense. I mean, I can go into some of these other page objects. Like here's the, the my boards page. Uh, here it only had one locator as well, but the, the expect loaded, there's a bit more going on in here for assertions, right? You know, expect it to be visible, and then I expect every one of my board's names to be appearing. Or if I have the board page, this one is a bit more complicated because there's more stuff on the board page. But you can see how I line up all of my locators, I construct all of my locators, and then I have multiple methods. Like uh, I'm adding something to the list, I'm adding a card to a list, I want to navigate back home. Um, all these kinds of things happening. So rather than polluting my high level test case functions, I can just call these more concise, more readable kinds of methods. Oh, someone's saying in the chat, actually I really like this. Awesome. Uh, gives you a way to do a version of user stories without having to mess with Cucumber or Gherkin integration. Oh, you're killing me. I love, I love, I love BDD. That's okay. That's all right. It's all right. Yeah, you you can you can do BDD with Playwright. You can choose to not do BDD with Playwright. It's all good. Um, uh, do I see somebody raising their hand? You do. It's me. Um, I used um, I used Selenium in the past. So uh, as you were showing me this, it brought me memories, and they were not nice memories. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it was the fact that it was breaking up a test, a simple test, then it will break up in two files, and then that file sometimes needs to be reused, and then there may be interaction that you want to do multiple pages. And so the thing that looks clear on the first, on, on one example, it turned out to be, you know, it turns out to be hard to maintain it because you don't know which test uses it. So if you change some other test. So my question was, is there a possibility to do what you did, that's kind of refactor, but in line and not having to do a different file, or does he have to follow the multiple file convention? So, I mean, <laughs> you can do what you want, my friend. You know, um, personally, like, if, if I'm taking a simple approach, I do like having these classes for the pages because it, it separates the concern of the workflow from the, the page structure, in a sense. Um, I mean, you could, if you really wanted to, like at the top of your test module, define all your locators. Like you, you could do that. You can make objects and then just use them, right? Um, instead of putting them in different files. Uh, the, the problem with that is what if you have different tests that use the same locators? Um, moreover- So the woman will me... look, apologies. So you go ahead, you go ahead. I was gonna say, another thing is, I think the page object pattern is good. I don't think it's great. I honestly believe the screenplay pattern is a much better way to model interactions, which might touch on a few more of your concerns. Um, screenplay is a bit more complicated, both in terms of setting it up and using it. So I don't, I usually don't teach that as like an intro or intermediate level thing. So I'm not gonna show it here today, but if you wanna learn more about it, there are resources on it, just look it up. Can you just introduce, can you just tell us what it is screenplay? Because probably so, we so many yes, questions. yes. So in screenplay pattern is, it is a object oriented way of separating concerns even further. The idea of screenplay is that there are three main things, actors, abilities, and interactions. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. The actor is an initiator of things. So it could be a tester, a caller, whatever. Abilities are tools that you use. Like for example, Playwright would be an ability because it enables you to browse the web or call APIs. 
Um, interactions are things like as simple as click, fill, all that, but also workflows like, hey, I want to perform login. Hey, I want to create cards on my board. And interactions are highly composable. But what Screenplay Pattern does is it lets you separate page structure from the interactions themselves. Uh, it also lets you um, more easily handle like multi page flows or multi system interactions. Like if you have to do you web browser things together with API calls, right? You can kind of put them all together in 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 um, tasks and questions like that. Um, the the pattern itself is just fancy dependency injection to make all that happen and to keep them separate. So in a nutshell, that's what Screenplay does. Um, like I said, it's it's a bit more complicated to to explain and set up, but ultimately, if you're doing a large testing project, in my opinion, it, it is worth it because it pays dividends. Thank you. So much. If, if you want to learn more specifically about screenplay, I would recommend um, looking up the BOA constrictor project. It is a .NET implementation of screenplay pattern. So it's C sharp, I'm sorry. But um, if you go to the, the project page, there is a, a video that's about half an hour and it, it walks through what screenplay is. So um, if you're if you're not scared of C sharp code, <laughs> it focuses more on the the concepts rather than like implementation. Um, I am the lead developer for the Boa Constrictor project, so hence I would recommend that one. <laughs> uh, I don't know of any like or, no, that's not true. Um, there is a a JavaScript implementation of Screenplay. It's called um, Serenity JS. If you've heard of Serenity, um, I don't know if it has Playwright integration. I think it's something that dude wants to work on, but I don't know if it's quite there yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Any, any other questions before I keep going? Okay, cool, cool. So, um, one other thing I want to show you with these page objects that you, you may or may not have noticed is how they were included in the test. If you noticed our test signature here, right, it was similar to the one of the previous tests in that it had the same text title, right? But the pieces that were injected were different. In the previous test, we just injected page, which is the playwright fixture for the page you interact with. But here I've actually got the, I've got fixtures for each of my page objects. Oh, that's really cool. In playwright, you can actually create your own fixtures. And if you're doing, if you're using page objects, then I strongly recommend creating fixtures for each page object so that you can easily inject it as you need. Uh, if you didn't do this, you'd have to do something like async page and then at the very at the very top of your test function, you'd have to do things like um, you know construct each object and inject the page in yourself, which becomes very repetitive across different tests. So if you can create the fixtures for these, then you save yourself a lot of hassle. I put my fixtures under the test folder in a directory called fixtures, and so here in this Trello test TS uh, module, you can see. How I the way that you do that you make fixtures in Playwright is you import the original test object as like a base and then you extend it. I'm importing my three page object classes, um, and then I'm creating this <laughs> um, this particular type that has all of my different page object types. I extend the base test, and I'm adding each of these objects now as a fixture. And I'm saying, here's what this particular thing means. It means you're going to uh, use the new um, page object, that, a new page object that you're going to, to construct, inject the regular playwright page, and then at the end, export it all so everybody can use it. So in my test, instead of importing the test and expect functions from playwright directly, I'm now importing them from my fixture override. And so I can call test with these fixtures now on it. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty nifty trick. I recommend doing this with, with um, any, any time you create a new page object, so that way you can get it more easily. Uh, in Python, you can do a very similar trick. It's not a playwright trick, but it's more just part of the PyTest framework. 
I, I don't know of ways to do this kind of trick in Java or C Sharp. But yeah, so now we have pages that we can just inject at will and then use them and our test is a lot better. <laughs> cool, cool. All righty, are we ready for a little bit more refactoring? Yeah, cool, cool, cool. So if branch, uh, copy, copy, copy. So one thing that I personally do not like about this test is that it is rather long and not long in the sense of, oh my gosh, there's too many lines, but rather it covers more than one target behavior. This test is saying, create a new board with a list and cards. But really there's, there's multiple behaviors being tested here, right? You've got the idea of creating a board. You've got the idea of creating a list. You've got the idea of creating cards. You've got a navigation here. And so this really isn't an atomic test. This is more of what I call a grand tour. Um, grand tours are easier to write because you can just keep going and going and going and going. But the problem is they don't scale well, right? They're, each one becomes longer to execute because you've got more stuff going in it. And when this test fails, it doesn't denote a specific singular reason for failure, right? If this test fails, it could be for any one of these steps, right? Which means any one of these behaviors could be the culprit in a failure. I don't like to develop my test suites that way. I want each test to, to yield a result on an individual independent behavior because I want to know, is it adding the card that failed or is it the creating the board that failed? I don't want to have to go digging deeper to find that. I want my report to tell me. Remember, fast feedback, modern testing, easy button, <laughs> right? That's what I really want out of this. So what I want to do in our next step of refactoring is to split this test up into smaller tests so that I can have individual results for each behavior that I'm trying to test. So get check out. I'm going to check out the branch that has that code and we'll walk through it together. All right, so now our Trello test looks a bit different. Uh, we still have the page objects, you know, that's that was from the previous chapter. But now we're going to have many more tests. And if I just click the word test, you can see, oh my gosh, I've got a lot going on here. So what did we do? Uh, what I did is, first of all, I grouped all of my tests together in this describe section. Um, if if y'all have done Mocha before or Jest or Cypress, the describe it should syntax I'm presuming is probably familiar to you. Yep. Um, side note, that is very much a JavaScript thing. In other stacks like Python and Java, nobody uses that formulation. When I first came to the JavaScript world and I saw that, I'm like, what are they doing? I'm like, okay, I guess this makes sense. It's very unique. I just wanted y'all to know. But it's like, okay, we conform to what's going on. Boom. So the describe is going to group all of these tests together hierarchically. So we're describing the Trello-like board. I don't want to call it Trello because I don't want to get in trouble with Atlassian, but Trello-like app, right? Um, I've got some constants here just to use as names for testing, like our chores and our to-do. Um, I think it's good to, to set them as constants and just kind of use them. That way you don't fat finger anything. Mm. So what do I want to do now with each of these tests? Um, in the previous example, we had a before all section that would have cleared the database before all the tests run. We need to, to change that up a little bit because now that we have multiple tests happening, uh, we need to kind of establish a, a good starting state for each of them. And so rather than a before all, what I'm now doing is I want to before each, meaning before every single one of these tests run, I want to do some setup. And what do I want to do? First of all, before each test, I do still want to wipe out the database, right? Uh, we'll look into that a little bit later. But um, just to keep things simple for now, I want to wipe out the database. And then I also want to create the first board as a starting point for all these tests. Right, so we wipe out the database, we add a new board. That way, um, we don't have to worry about each test repetitively creating its own board. There's a, an equal starting spot for all of them. Furthermore, the app works differently. When you don't have any boards, it'll show you that, that big screen with the pretty artwork to say, hey, enter your first board. If you already have a board, it goes to a different screen that shows you all the boards with a button to say, create them. That creates a problem because 
If you have one test that creates a board, it will get the one screen. The following test will create, will already have a board in there potentially. So then it, it could mess up the whole flow of the app. So rather than fight that issue, just nuke everything to begin with, start create a new board for each one. And that can be our starting point. Um, that was a testing decision that I had to make as the tester in this case. Are there other decisions that could have been made that are valid? Yes. Why did I make this? Because. <laughs> so there's more than one way to do this. This is the way I've chosen to do it for these this small test suite that we're building. So once we have that set up, I have three different tests here. Uh, I have a test that should create the first board. So I'm just making sure that after the setup created the board, I'm, make, I'm performing an assertion to make sure that it was good. Same page object code we had before, now just structured differently in terms of the test. Uh, I have the test for should create the first list in a board, right? So assuming that a board is there, let me add a list and make sure that that got added. And then I have a test for uh, should create a list with multiple cards. And so I'm in this one, I'm adding a list and I'm adding all these cards and then I'm verifying that the cards are good, right? So now when I run this, it's essentially going to be covering all the same behaviors pretty much as the previous one, except that navigation one, I've left that one. Oh, wait, no, there's one bonus. I didn't scroll far enough. The fourth test, sorry, should navigate home from a board. You're at your home, you're at the board page, you click the home button, you make sure you get back. So we actually have four tests here, my bad. Um, it's all the same behaviors that the previous test covered, but I've now broken them up so that I have separate test cases for each one, meaning separate results for each one. Um, somebody in the Ignacio, it's a trade-off between time spent setting up each test versus knowing exactly what failed. True, yes. You could argue that this is a little bit more inefficient. Um, Based on my experience with quality testing, reporting all the stuff over the past several years, absolutely hard favor knowing exactly what failed. Being atomic, no question in my mind. <laughs> and playwrights fast anyway, so it's not like you're taking too much of a hit. Um, other things you might notice is that these behaviors, many of them don't have this, don't need to go through the whole workflow, right? For example, in order to test that the navigation home button works, I don't necessarily need to have anything on my board created, right? I just need a board there and I need to be on the page that shows the board, then I can click right back home. So a lot of times what I find is people add extra setup stuff that doesn't need to be there. And so by breaking things apart atomically like this, many times people find that they're actually, even though it takes a little more um, setup and cleanup and teardown time, in terms of the execution of the tests, um, they find that they're not including all that unnecessary setup anymore. So their tests actually might get a, a bit of a performance boost out of that. So um, that's another reason why I strongly favor this kind of approach. Um, so I'll stop here and ask um, any, any questions about what we did there? Cool. I have a question, but it's not on what we did right now. Is okay. on the way we do the locator. So okay. I noticed in one of your pages, so if you mm -hmm. go to the board or any of the file, um, I noticed that when you declared the locator on number nine for line nine, you didn't put mm -hmm. the weight. Okay, so it was page, get by text. Mm -hmm. Am I correct to assume that if you save the locator like that as a variable, you're actually just trying to fetch the locator when you use it with an await and something else? So if I do await my board dot text. Is that correct that he actually is trying to fetch the locator at that given time and not before? Yeah, it, it will fetch the object at that time. The, the, the object at that time, right? Yes, and yes. The, remember, the locator is the pointer. Sorry, so I'm you sorry, can construct a locator object. It's just like a reference variable. And then yeah. it's when you perform the interaction is when Playvert will, uh, will essentially enact that locator to get the element object okay. to, to do the stuff on it. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's it very important. A big issue. This was a big issue in Selenium because you could not yeah. declare things. And it was very hard to read because if you declare something, it will actually fetching it and then it was undefined or something. Yep. So it's very yep. important. That's a big, big, big plus. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that's you, since you have Selenium experience, I can, I can further this and say like in Playwright, you don't directly interact with the element objects. Right, that's kind of the layer beneath you. In Selenium, you had you you had no choice but to directly interact with the element objects, and so it is a hallmark of a good web testing framework that that keeps you away from 
accessing the element objects directly. That you you do it through locators, and you you would only get the elements at execution at dynamically when you need to interact with them. And then you yourself, the programmer, shouldn't have your your fingers on them. It should be handled for you. Um, also, going back to what I said about screenplay pattern and boa constrictor, that design element is is crucial in screenplay like that it is designed around that and so in bow constructor it's the same kind of thing where you don't actually touch the elements right you you touch the locators and you handle interactions but the elements are beneath you so more right cool, cool. all righty i know we're we're running low on time here so um let me just check out the the final version of the code here that that i would want to show um <clears throat> Excuse me, <coughs> pardon me. So if we wanted to uh, refactor even more, um, there's, hold on one second. Like I said before, it, with the basic kind of the setup we had, we couldn't run the tests in parallel because if you wipe out the database that affects all the other tests in parallel. Um, that's not necessarily what you want to do. You really want to have parallel execution for your test suites, especially at an end-to-end -end level, because um, there ain't enough time in the universe to get all this stuff done. <laughs> and Playwright, what, one thing I really like about Playwright is it natively enables that parallel execution out of the box. Uh, you, by default, what it will do with, with the JavaScript runner, uh, the Playwright test, is that it will look at like the number of cores or something you have on your machine, and then use that as the basis for the number of workers it, it launches and then each worker will run tests. And so you can have four workers running tests in parallel um, and it's, it just it happens out of the box. And by default, it also does cross browser for you. Like you saw when I ran the command, I had to limit um, the number of workers and the number of um, uh, browsers it was testing just to make sure it stayed serial. Um, the, the issue with parallel execution is not so much in does the framework support it? Yes, it does out of the box. The issue is in the, um, excuse me, the test data management. I think somebody in the chat said, oh man, we should have like a talk on test data management. Oh boy. If you Google managing the test data nightmare, I've given a talk on this in all the different places. It's recorded, you can watch it. Um, test data is a nightmare, right? Because it if you don't handle it right, you can have tests colliding on it, on shared data. And like, like with a database, all these tests are sharing one database, therefore they could go kaboom. Um, there are many ways to try to make it work. Um, I, I tend to prefer simple being better than complex, therefore for small demos and projects and initial tutorials, I try to keep things basic. But I mean, you could do things like trying to run multiple instances of your web app, each with its own database, and then have some sort of round robin with the worker that gets it next. Um, you could try to have maybe one application, but separate test data sets per worker. Um, you could you could simply just try to make sure that your tests um, only ever create new data dynamically and never try to access shared data. It kind of limits your test suite and what it can do. Um, so there's there's all sorts of sorts of issues. Um, what I chose to do with with mine. Um, I chose to rewrite the tests such that um, they would always use dynamically unique dynamically created data. So that way, um, rather than wiping out the entire database at the start of every test, accept the database with whatever garbage it has in it, and every test creates a new board that that test uses exclusively. And then to formulate your verifications in ways that would be unaffected by other changes happening in the system. Um, it's usually the um, simplest way to handle data in terms of preparation and cleanup, but it, it can be a little bit more difficult in how you would write the test, but not, not too much. It, it more just limits the kinds of things you can check. So here in this, in this test, uh, this final version of the test, we can see some of these changes having been made. So I still have a before each, and what I'm doing is um, instead of wiping out the database, I am I'm using an API, API-driven test prep, um, await request post, 
here where I am essentially creating a new board with specific data on that board. Now, what I did to create this board, the, the data needs to have a board name and the name I'm giving to the board is chores with a random number. You might be wondering, why are you just giving a random number to the board? The reason is every single test needs a unique board name, right? Why? Because if it has, if this test has a unique board name, then no other test could accidentally collide on that unique name. Oh, how do I generate unique names? Simplest way, random number, <laughs> right? Let me just get around. Nobody is, no other test is going to be dealing with chores one, two, three, four, five, right? The next test will deal with chores six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? How did I? Unique data, <laughs> unique dynamically generated data that only this particular test will ever access. Yes, it's low tech, but it works. So I'm gonna create that board with that unique name Then I'm gonna load the page and open the board, right? That's no different from the other tests we saw. After that, the tests are pretty much the same, right? Because they'll have whatever that board name was, right? I had to create that as a variable that would be shared. Uh, but otherwise, the, the steps are the same. Why? Because they each get their own unique board on their own unique, um, uh, what's it called, um, worker. And now with this, we have basically re-enabled parallel execution for our test suite. And so if I were to run this now, uh, I can say, oopsie, uh, npx playwright test uh, tests. I still want to only do this particular feature file or not feature file, oh my gosh. Wow, Cucumber, um, this particular TypeScript module. And this time I'm not going to limit the browsers and I'm not going to limit the workers. I'm not going to run it in headed mode because all these windows will just pop up like crazy. But we can see running 12 tests using five workers and it's just, it's grinding so fast through it. Bam, 12, all 12 now pass versus having issues that we had before. Um, also it took, 6.5 seconds to run 12 web tests. I just want to say anyone who, who has done Selenium knows how phenomenal that is, <laughs> how fast that is. Don't take that for granted. Or no, do take it for granted and do more web UI testing because you can now. You don't need to limit yourself to the period. <laughs> take it for granted. <laughs> but yeah, um, so now I can successfully run all these atomic tests in parallel with proper test data strategy. Cool. So I see a question. Um, is there a hook we can use to clean up the database after all the workers finished? Uh, I want to say yes and no. First of all, what you've hit on is, is one issue with this test data strategy is that, okay, well, I'm just going to be polluting my database with all sorts of garbage. Eventually, I'm going to need to clean it up. Um, why? Because Well, first of all, the more records you have in there, the less performant your app is, which is going to slow it down. Um, secondly, most likely you're running this in a CI system. And if you don't do cleanup appropriately, you might topple over your server because you run out of either memory or storage. Done that before. Um, if you're containerized, it gets wiped away anyway. So maybe it's not a big deal. But if, you, if you're not containerized, then you're going to have to do some sort of cleanup at some points. Um, now, somebody in the chat said, oh, there's after all. Um, yes and no. Uh, the, yeah, after all, it would still cause issues between browsers running in parallel. Correct. The before and after, the before all, sorry, before all and after all hooks in Playwright are not universal to the entire test suite. They apply to each worker. So if you have four workers, actually I had five workers. Look at that. That's awesome. Let's stick with four. If you had four workers, your before all and after all are running four times, once for each worker. And so if you have, if you wanted to add a, a database drop and an after all, what's going to happen is whichever worker finishes first is going to drop the database, which means these three other workers that are still testing all of a sudden had the carpet pulled out from underneath of them. Right? So what I would say is it would be advantageous to pull your test data management strategies outside of the, um, the test suite, outside of the test setup and cleanup. 
make them more like other processes that are part of your execution process, right? You, you, you don't have to clean up the database within Playwright. You can run all your Playwright tests. And then the next step in your GitHub Actions YAML file or your Circle CI steps or your Jenkins process or whatever can be go in there and reset the database afterwards, right? You know, it's a, just, you, you don't have to shove everything into the, the test launch step, right? You can have multiple steps in your pipeline that are like, oh, well, I have pre preparatory things here, here, then I run the tests, then I publish the reports, then I whack the database, right? Think about it in terms of, of the pipelines like that, right? And I think you'll find that, oh, then maybe, maybe the playwright part can really just kind of focus in on the testing concern. Yes, separate those concerns. <laughs> I put in the, the data prep here because um, it was easier to show that in terms of this tutorial and, and talk, right? Um, and even like I put like in, in the fully refactored thing, the idea of creating the, the board dynamically per test, that should be in because that's a test level thing, but bigger things you might wanna push out. So, wow, we are, we are past time, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome though. This all this information is so great. So thank you so much. And all the external resources you linked as well to figure out more, you know, dive deeper into some of these things has also been really awesome. So yes. Yeah. Okay, where do we find you? It's uh automation panda on Twitter. Is that the yep, best I'm place? On, yeah, so Twitter automation panda. You can also hit me up on LinkedIn. Um okay. if you search for me, I, I can drop a link in the chat. Um great. but yes, yeah, I'd love to keep in touch. Thank you so much. We will see you soon. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye.